In the spring of 1991, a group of Boy Scouts spent the weekend in the woods, hoping to earn merit badges for survival in the wilderness. But just 10 days later, one of the scouts, Damien Hearsink, was fighting for his own survival as he lay near death in a hospital. Doctors wanted to find the cause, and they also needed to find a cure. Sink family have a quiet, active life in the small town of Dothan, Alabama. Marnix Hearsink is a busy eye surgeon, and he met his wife, Mary, while he was in medical school. The Hearsink family soon grew to include four children, three boys, Damien, Sebastian, Bain, and a daughter named Myla, all intelligent, active, and healthy. About a week after Damien Hearsink returned from the Boy Scout trip, his mother prepared to take Damien and his brother to Florida. Damien was headed to space camp, and Sebastian was going to tennis camp. Sebastian and his mother packed the van because Damien wasn't feeling well. He had a slight fever and some diarrhea. His parents thought it might have been the pizza Damien ate at a friend's house, or perhaps it was just a virus going through Damien's school. And like you respond to all of those kinds of bugs and little illnesses, as a, as a parent, you think, OK, I'm going to fix it. Mary packed anti-diarrheal medicine and some drinks to replenish the fluids. And they headed to Florida, intending to drive straight through the night. Damien's symptoms didn't respond to the medicine, and they were forced to make frequent stops. On the trip, it became apparent that he was dealing with something more complicated than a flu. Mary decided it was best to stop for the night and let Damien rest. Then we went through a night where he just lived in the bathroom, back and forth, uh, the hotel room, uh, all night using the bathroom. And the next morning, I woke up thinking, OK, it was one of those weird things. We're OK. Let's go on our way, get to space camp, get to tennis camp. The next day, Damien was no better. In fact, as his mother drove towards Tampa, she noticed that Damien was getting worse. She was really getting pretty worried that Damien was uh, that, that really pretty sick, that he had, uh, pretty frankly, a lot of diarrhea and there was some blood in it. That's very abnormal, and that's when I realized that something was more serious than just a very bad case of the flu, and that we had to get him into some kind of care. They drove to a local hospital where x-rays showed his intestines were swollen. The news was not good. Additional tests showed that there were deadly toxins collecting in Damien's blood, evidence that his kidneys were shutting down. It needs to be very carefully watched because it could be the start of something disastrous. Doctors didn't know what was causing Damien's illness, but if the problem wasn't identified quickly, Damien would die. As Damien's condition worsened, he was quickly transferred to a pediatric intensive care unit at another hospital when the diarrhea turned to hemorrhaging. It was like literally all hell was breaking loose. Now it just poured out of him. And it wasn't so much diarrhea as it was just hemorrhage, just pan after pan of clotted uh, blood pouring out of him. Damien's red blood cells were being destroyed and his kidneys were shutting down. Tests showed that he was suffering from a rare, life-threatening condition called hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. Although his father was a doctor, it was a disease he had never heard of. I didn't know what this disease was. So I <clears throat> fortunately had some books with me, et cetera, and I looked it up, and I really realized that this was a, uh, this is a bad disease. Terry Shoes was the first nurse who cared for Damien. We all knew in our hearts what might happen. And when we were sure it was hemolytic uremic syndrome, that's when the fear set in and we knew we had to become very aggressive. HUS is caused by a lethal bacteria, 
one which creates a toxin, a chemical poison that attacks the blood vessels and the blood. It triggers a deadly cascade of events. First, red blood cells are shredded. The blood loses its clotting ability, but at the same time, the broken cells clump together, creating a life-threatening dam in the bloodstream. And when the clumps reach vital organs, it deprives them of blood and oxygen. Damien's parents read all they could about this mysterious blood disease, desperate to find out what caused it. Mary pored over the medical literature. She learned that HUS is usually linked to contaminated food, but no one else in the family had gotten sick. Could it be the pizza Damien had at a friend's house? What about the Boy Scout trip? Was the bacteria in the water, or was it something in the food? I needed to get on the phone, call home. Nobody in our town was aware of what kind of trouble Damien was in at that point. Call the scoutmaster and, and ask him, was anybody else sick? Because that became my concern, is that there were other kids who may have been poisoned. Mary was surprised and confused by the answer. None of the other Boy Scouts were sick. How on earth can this child fall into this deep hole with no explanation? The source of Damien's illness remained a mystery, but its severity was becoming all too clear. Dr. Daniel Placencia led a team of doctors who would try to keep Damien alive. It was uh, affecting different organs, and that process kind of put him in the severe category. Onto the stomach. Doctors told the Mary about HUS and its unpredictability that it launches random attacks on the body's critical organs, creating deadly complications without warning. And there was little doctors could do to stop it. And you realize he can die? It's an impossible thought for someone like me, for most parents. And at that point, uh, the doctors told me that there was really nothing that you could do, that we just had to watch, cross our fingers, wait, and hope that this beast didn't take a lethal hit on, on one of Damien's major organ systems. Damien's condition worsened by the minute. Blood tests showed that his system was overflowing with toxins. Damien needed dialysis to cleanse his blood just to stay alive. Then in the middle of the night, I got a phone call from Mary saying that uh, it's, it's really to a point where you need to come. By the time Marnix flew in from Alabama, the deadly toxins coursing through his bloodstream were affecting Damien's neurological system. The danger was real and frightening. I had a tough time when I had to go in and, and uh, talk to Damien the first night, the first day that I was there. And the reason it was so tough was he was really losing it. You know, he, he, uh, he, just, would, he just wasn't coherent as, as he normally is. And it, it became real clear to me that he was having a microembolic mini strokes, sort of like strokes. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it was probably the hardest time for me because his body was there, but his mind was not. Dialysis kept Damien alive, but the disease was raging like a fire through his body. As a doctor, Marnix understood the test results, and he knew his son was dying. He was in a very bad downward spiral. Every turn seemed to be on the down side. I was really seeing the actual disease take its ravaging effects on him right before our eyes. And x-rays showed that fluid was collecting around Damien's heart. More than a liter of fluid was siphoned away, allowing his heart to beat more freely. But a few hours later, right? his parents were in his room when Somebody tragedy here. struck. Help us. We need help. Without warning, Damien's blood pressure went into a free fall. The hearsinks were watching their son die before their very eyes. Damien started to shake and convulse and turn blue, and he was dying. And it is so terrifying that you, you just are reduced to begging God to let your child live for one more minute. There was a frantic effort to restore Damien's blood pressure before it damaged his heart or brain. We gave him extra fluid intravenously. We must have given him uh, half a liter to a liter of fluid to restore his fluid volume. Gradually, his blood pressure increased, and Damien survived a brush with death. But the disease had only begun to reveal its power.
the hearsinks agonized. What caused this terrible tragedy to happen to their son? And why wasn't there a treatment? While Damien lay near death in a pediatric intensive care unit, his father desperately searched for answers. He called an old friend from medical school who specializes in John. blood disorders. John, uh, Marnik's here, sink here, uh, from medical school? They hadn't yeah. spoken in nearly 10 years, but Marnix was desperate. So my personal feeling was that the doctors here are very good, but they don't see this very often. Marnix began to describe the symptoms to his friend, but before he could finish, Dr. Kelton knew the diagnosis. I knew what he had in two sentences on a telephone. John Kelton had spent his entire career studying rare blood diseases many doctors had never seen, and he knew from his experience that the worst wasn't over. In subsequent telephone calls, it became apparent to me and of considerable concern to me that Damien was moving from this localized illness called hemolytic uremic syndrome into the far more severe illness called thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Dr. Kelton knew something the local doctors did not. There was only one thing that would keep Damien alive. A risky, unproven treatment many doctors believed was too experimental. It was called a plasma exchange. Nine out of 10 people who have thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura and are not treated will die. The plasma exchange was a controversial recommendation. It involves completely exchanging the liquid part of the patient's blood with donated plasma. What it is doing is washing out toxic substances from the bloodstream. The massive transfusions would mean additional risks, a possible HIV or hepatitis infection. But Dr. Kelton knew that the greater risk was not doing anything. I emphasized that when I've known of similar patients who did not receive treatment, they invariably worsened, and the outcome was death. Once the daily plasma exchanges started, Damien's condition began to improve. And I could see that, in my judgment, toxins and poisons and really awful things were being just suctioned out of his body. Meanwhile, Mary Hirsink continued to educate herself on hemolytic uremic syndrome and the bacteria that caused it. 96 to 98 percent of the cases of HUS are caused by this new lethal microbe exploding in our food supply. This is the bacteria. It's called E. coli 0157. Watch and you can see how one bacteria can multiply and become a deadly threat. Epidemiologists can trace it back only as far as the early 1970s, but it's already the leading cause of kidney failure in American children. It kills 500 people in the United States each year, most of them children. Somehow the E. coli bacteria entered Damien's system and triggered the horrible blood disorder. Damien probably ingested the deadly bacteria about a week to 10 days earlier. A single bacterium could have ignited the chain of events, wildly multiplying in the warm, moist recesses of Damien's intestines. But where did it come from? Contaminated water, meat, unpasteurized juice? And if it happened while he was on the scout camping trip, why weren't any of the other scouts infected? Before doctors knew if the plasma therapy would work, the disease struck again. An echocardiogram revealed that Damien's heart was still under attack. They have to go in and pull off this fluid which is accumulating around his heart and in essence drowning him. Now drastic measures would be needed to keep Damien alive. He needed more heart surgery. If something isn't done then the heart will eventually stop. Was the plasma exchange started too late to halt the damage to his internal organs? His doctors and nurses weren't sure. It was really hard. It was. Because you just can't let kids die without a fight. Damien did fight, and he survived the heart surgery. 
Soon, Damien started to show some improvement. The plasma exchanges continued. Damien could breathe on his own, but the disease was preparing another deadly assault on his weakened body. It started innocently enough. He was so thirsty. He was just really dying to get some fluids in. And we started with a little bit of fluid. And then Mama went to get him some ice drink that she'd promised him. When Damien took a few sips, disaster struck. An excruciating abdominal pain overwhelmed him. And Marnix was certain at that moment that we had another catastrophe. X-rays confirmed Marnix's worst fears. The disease had blown a hole in Damien's intestines. Poisonous bacteria were now being released into his body, and Damien would need emergency surgery. It was the first time I think I really accepted that Damien could and would die, and you know, I had to get ready now for him to die, that this is going to be the end. The anesthesia, the surgery, the bacteria pouring from his intestines, any one of these were enough to kill Damien. He had uh, very little to fight with. You refuse to lose your hope, though, but you get this grim feeling inside, like you just don't know if you can do any more for them. Damien's parents and his doctors didn't know if he could survive another battle. How did the deadly E. coli bacteria enter Damien Hearsink? Was it from the water at Boy Scout camp, or was the bacteria in the food? And if it was something he ate at Boy Scout camp, why weren't any of the other boys sick? Surprisingly, the answer came from Damien himself. It came to him in a dream as he lay in the hospital. It happened at scout camp. It was my job to make the hamburger patties, and we cooked them on a grill over the campfire. We stacked them up on a tray, and I went up to the table to get one. I was really hungry, and I saw a small piece of meat on the plate. It was just a tiny piece, which looked like it fell off one of the burgers. I was so hungry that I grabbed the piece and ate it. I knew there was a problem. It was cold. It looked like it was cooked, but it was almost raw. All my friends were around. I didn't want to just spit it out in front of them, so I just swallowed it. When Damien woke up after his dream, he told his father what happened. But he independently came to the realization and reported it almost as a confessional to his dad that, I know it made me sick, Dad. It was when I swallowed that. I knew that was wrong. Something was wrong about that. That's what made me sick. Thoroughly cooking hamburger usually kills the E. coli bacteria. But since Damien ate a piece of rare meat, the E. coli bacteria were multiplying inside his system within minutes of ingestion. By the time Damien left for space camp a week later, the E. coli bacteria had begun to produce toxins which attacked his vital organs. Ironically, the medicine Damien took to relieve his diarrhea during the trip probably made his condition worse because it hindered his body's attempt to flush the bacteria from his system. Fortunately for Damien, the experimental plasma exchange worked. It saved his life by removing the deadly toxins from his bloodstream. After five weeks in intensive care, seven operations, and many agonizing brushes with death, Damien survived his war against the deadly E. coli bacteria. At the same camping trip that Damien was on, other children ate the same food. It only happened to him. Why did it happen to him? Well, the answer on a trivial level is, is that it was fate but obviously there is something in certain individuals that put them at risk of having this reaction. It's pretty scary, just whenever I get a chance to think about it and think about everything that happened to me. I see I'm pretty lucky to be alive right now. But others haven't been as fortunate. In 1993, an outbreak of E. coli at several jack-in-the-box restaurants killed three people. and it left this victim, 10-year-old Brianne Kiner, with permanent brain damage. 
and in the summer of 1996, more than 9,000 Japanese school children were infected with the E. coli bacteria. 11 died. E. coli bacteria usually come from the intestines of cattle. Cow manure with E. coli can get washed into streams and cause contamination. And when manure is used for fertilizer, it can contaminate apples which fall to the ground. If those same apples are made into cider and it's not pasteurized, the cider can also be contaminated. But the most common method of E. coli infection is through contaminated ground beef when it isn't properly cooked. One study found that three and a half percent of the ground beef sold in supermarkets was infected with the deadly E. coli 0157. And there's also the problem of cross-contamination. Liquids from tainted ground beef can contaminate other foods in a refrigerator or on countertops. This is a disease that was unheard of or very, very rare even 10, 15 years ago. And it's now in just a decade become the leading cause of kidney failure in United States children. It's one of the leading causes of pediatric death in certain countries like Argentina. Damien Hirsink's brush with E. coli has not only changed his life, but also his family's. His mother has written a book about Damien's story and founded an international organization dedicated to eliminating E. coli from our food supply. Damien is one of the lucky ones. Today, he's a healthy 16-year-old. He plays on the high school basketball team, watches his brothers play on the school football team, and is starting to look at colleges. Whenever I think about everything that happened to me and everything that could have gone wrong but didn't, I'm you know, very fortunate. He has lost 25% of his lung capacity and will always be at risk of future kidney problems. But his story has continued to help others. Damien is our masterpiece. He is probably one of our best accomplishments and, and successes because he had so many critical problems and he came out so well. I believe that a lot of the things that I have in my life are because of things other people have done for me and our family and, and, and certainly myself. I, we have an obligation to try to make things better for others because what we have is uh, we have life, we have our son, and we have a, uh, a, a wonderful family. And we need to be able to give back, and that's what we're trying to do. I just want to say hi to everybody down in Tampa, like Dr. Placencia, all the nurses, Terry, Sarah, MT, all the, all the nurses, they know who they are. And thank you. And watch what you eat. <laughs>